Welcome to the 11:30 Wednesday lunch and Bible study uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We uh, we normally have lunch here on Wednesdays, but because of the, vi the virus, the COVID-19 virus, we're not able to do it this time. So we bring our lessons to you at your dinner tables, uh, wherever you are eating with us today. Uh, during uh, our series we just uh, got over, which was quenching the Holy Spirit, quenching the indwelling Holy Spirit, uh, we did a series of lessons on that subject matter because of interest uh, on the ministry of the Holy Spirit in regard to that. We discovered by the request we're getting in from people who are viewing from with us from around the globe that people don't really understand the offenses that can be committed by a Christian against the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it hinders the operation of the Holy Spirit, which is the key to the church age ministry. Jesus seated at the right hand of God the Father. We, it, the, the whole ministry of the church is assigned to the third member of the Godhead called the Holy Spirit. Well, We've got some requests in, and one was, uh, could you help explain the grieving of the Spirit? So I decided to do another series called uh, Grieving the Holy Spirit, taken from Ephesians 4.30. And I felt it was important to give you an introduction to the different offenses against the quenching and grieving are only two of eight that we'll mention to you today. So I felt it was important, not only that, but how does the Holy Spirit indwelling me operate through my human spirit in my life uh, in, in a supernatural and dramatic ways? I thought that would be of interest to you. And so I'm going to do a series of lessons on grieving the Holy Spirit like we did on quenching. Now, in Ephesians, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4.30 with me, I have mine already open, ready to go. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom the Holy Spirit of God, that's the indwelling spirit, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, the day of redemption is the rapture of the church at the second coming of Christ. What's of interest to me and should be to you is the word do not quench or do not, uh, do not grieve. That's a present active imperative. That's a command, second person plural. That includes the entire body of Christ, the church. Every member, every believer in Christ, th those who believe that Christ came to die for their sins, he was buried, and on the third day of his burial was raised from the dead. That's called the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The person that believes that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit until and sealed until the day of redemption. Think about that phenomenal promise that's given to us. Now, the word sealed has been introduced in the book of, of uh, Ephesians in the first chapter, verses 13 and 14. So let's look at that, and then we'll have a word of prayer. I'm in 1, 13, 14. In him, Christ, that's positional truth, in him, he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And when we hear the gospel and believe the gospel, we're placed into union with Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father by the Holy Spirit called baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says, in him, now watch this, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, see, you were sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit of promise, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view, with a view, now watch that, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now, sealed, sealed to the redemption of his own possession takes us to chapter 4 and verse 30. Where he, where he describes it as uh, the Holy Spirit has sealed for the day of redemption. So you can see the correlation to that. Today we're going to do an introduction to you on grieving 
the indwelling Holy Spirit. A believer does that. A believer does that, okay, to the Holy Spirit who dwells in him. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember the Bible. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality, living in the flesh, the sin nature, living by the lust of the flesh, produces personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, just to give you an example. They have to be confessed in order to be returned to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That is done by confession. 1 John 1, 9 says something really interesting. It's my favorite verse, and I use it all the time because of the word cleansing. Watch that word, cleansing. If we confess our sins, talking to Christians, the book of 1 John is written to Christians. If we confess our sins, personal sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. This is a Christian being cleansed by the blood of Christ mentioned in 1 John 1, 7. You see, the, the work of Christ, the blood of Christ on the cross, the spiritual implications to our life is for salvation. It removes Adamic sin, Romans 5, Romans 5th chapter. It removes the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin from our life. That's cleansing and how do we get that? We believe the gospel, and we get that. You can find all that in the... Go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. On the front page, look for 50 things, 50... I think they may be called free, 50 free things. And you'll find that there listed. You can read that. Pull it down and read it, right? So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us. So cleansing works to the unbeliever when he believes the gospel, just like he said here. We read it earlier. He hears it and he believes it. He gets cleansed. When he gets cleansed, he gets sealed by the Holy Spirit, sealed into the day of redemption. Now, for the Christian's life, it works by confession. When I confess, I'm returned from carnality to spirituality by confession of my sin. I don't confess my sin to get saved. I believe that Christ has done the work necessary to bring me into a, a complete relationship with God where I'm his child and he is my Abba Father. So that's important. So let's take a moment, give you an opportunity to confess sin. Make sure you got your Bible paper and a pencil unless you pull down our notes. You need to do that. And so, our Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the opportunity of freedom to, to preach the gospel, not only for those who have Internet access uh, or, or any kind of telecommunication uh, principle. We're, th we're thankful for that opportunity, Father, to reach uh, others with the truth of the message of Christ. And today we're going to look at grieving the Holy Spirit. We're going to introduce the idea it's how important is it? It's, 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 it's lights out important. I mean, it's, you, you, cannot, you cannot grieve the Holy Spirit and have, and have this phenomenal ministry in the church age. And so we're going to talk about that. The Ephesians had the problem, the church at Ephesus. And so we're going to talk about it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, when you take a look at Ephesians 4.30, you'll find that the word do not grieve has the negative may, in the Greek language, has the negative may, not, it's translated not, and lupeo. Lupeo is the word grieve. Now, we're familiar with grieve in the English language. I guess we all have grieved over something in our life. I've seen little kids grieve. I've got, I've got a six-year-old grandchild now, and I have a four-year-old grandchild, and I have a six-month-old grandchild. The six-old month child, we don't see grieving in him. We see displeasure, but we don't see grieving. But in my six-year-old and my four-year-old grandchild, 
I see grieving. They can grieve about a lot of different things. And that's interesting to me. So my, I, I, my understanding, it's an English idea as well, lupeo, to be, to be sorrowful or grieve, uh, to be painful in your heart. Uh, and sometimes um, it lasts a long time, doesn't it? And sometimes things can happen to, to resurface and bring that memory back up in those moments of grieving, and they bring sadness to us. Not so much the grieving part, but the sadness of it. And so grief is kind of an interesting word. When it's used in relation to, the, to, the God, to God or to the Holy Spirit or to the Lord Jesus Christ in their deity idea, it's used as a human term for us to understand something for us. It's a language of accommodation for us to understand what it, how it affects the deity how it affects God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that's important. And it's, a, and, and it's a word that a lot of us don't like to have to go through, and almost all of us go through it. Now, the interesting thing of do not grieve is that it's a present active imperative. The imperative in the Greek is a command. Therefore, the present tense is continuous. That's a standing command. Do not, or... In the present tense, it means stop doing that. Stop doing that. I want to take you to that idea today because it means stop doing this. And if you haven't done it, don't do it. Now, you're not grieved, but he is. But you cause it. You cause it. Stop causing the Holy Spirit to be grieved. Who lives in you? So that's an interesting concept, isn't it? There's another thing that's kind of interesting in the Greek language that the English doesn't show you. When it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, there's a definite article with all three. Do not grieve. There is, there's a definite article with the word holy. There's a definite, and I put them, in, in the, I put them on your paper. There's a definite article with the Holy Spirit, with spirit, and there's a definite article with the word God. Now, you don't have to do it, and the English didn't do it. But when the Greek does it, it makes each of those a separate idea. He, he says, I want you to focus on the holy part. That what you're grieving is the holiness. You're grieving holiness God is holy the son is holy the spirit is holy the Bible is holy you probably don't realize that you can grieve deity that you can grieve holiness do not grieve the holiness of the spirit of God there's a definite article where the spiritual will identifies the Holy Spirit as a member of the Godhead. Who is the, what, what is the spirit? Is it a, is it a something? No, it's a person. It doesn't matter if it's in the neuter in the Greek. It's a person. The word grieve, don't grieve, is a person. A lot of times in foreign languages, they'll put things by the way they were designed, not the way they're to be meant. It's a neuter idea, but it's a real person. It's a person. It's not a thing. It's a person. The Holy Spirit of God. God's not a thing. He's a person. And the Holy Spirit is different than God the Spirit. Or Jesus the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus or the Spirit of God. There is a person of the Godhead that's called Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Sometimes he's referred to as the Comforter in John 14, 15, 16. Sometimes he's called the Spirit of Truth. He's a, he's a Spirit. And I'm going to tell you why today, and it's important 
why is he called the Spirit? Jesus is called the Son. God is called the Father, but he's always called the Spirit. And it is in his relation to his ministry in the church that bears out great importance. This was true in the Old Testament, not that he indwelt, but he was called Holy Spirit. Now, so when we read this text, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom, uh, that's a relative pronoun, by whom you all, every believer in the church age, were sealed unto the day of redemption. The word sealed is an heir as passive indicative. You received this sealing outside yourself. The Holy Spirit seals you. You don't seal yourself. You don't seal yourself and you can't unseal yourself. Come on now. That's an important theological doctrine. Air is passive indicative, second person plural, you all. Now, I'm going to talk about four things if I have the time today. <laughs> I'm going to talk about four things. The first thing I need to tell you is that grieving the indwelling Holy Spirit is one of eight offenses against the Holy Spirit. A believer, now I'm only going to deal with the ones that the believer can do against him. The believer can quench and the believer can grieve, uh, can oppose, Galatians 5.17, insult, Hebrews 10.28, lie, Acts 5.3, tempt, Acts 5.9, resist, Acts 7, 51, and blaspheme, Matthew 12, 31, 32. There are eight offenses against the Holy Spirit. I'm focused on the ones that are against the indwelling, a believer and the indwelling of the Spirit. And so I've dealt with quenching. I'm dealing with grieving now. Point number two. See, that's important. You know that. See, a lot of people don't know that. There are eight offenses. I'm, I, right now, I'm dealing with the top two on your paper, quenching and grieving. I'm now dealing with grieving. Point number two. I said this in my introduction, but I want to make it a point. And if you're writing, I want you to write it because you probably didn't write it when I was doing my introduction. And is that important? The moment a person believes that Jesus Christ died for his sins or her sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day of the burial, he is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, listen to me now, forever. Write that word down, forever. John 14, 16, forever. When he takes up residence inside your body, he is there forever. You say, yeah, but my body's going to die and go back to the dust of the earth. I know, but he's with you forever. He takes residence up in your body, but he's with you forever. I mean, forever is forever. There's not a greater, I mean, how do you explain forever? The word explains itself. Now, human beings, they don't take that word serious. They don't understand. If you understand God, you understand forever. If you don't understand God, you don't understand forever. People will make the vow, I will, you know, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you forever. They do that in their marriage vows. When God says it, he means it. When we say it, mm, it's up for grabs. But forever, when God speaks forever, it is forever. There is no time barrier. It is forever. And he says it's forever. John 14, 16. Now, what I just explained to you is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the dead, from the dead on the third day of his burial. I've just explained Romans 1, 16. The gospel, which I just explained. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. How am I saved? You got to believe the gospel. 
Oh, I got to join a church. Mm -mm, nah, not to be saved. Oh, well, I got to make it public. Not to be saved. I got to confess my sin. Not to be saved. All the work necessary for you to be saved by grace through faith, by believing, was done by Jesus Christ, not by you. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace I am saved through faith, and not by myself, or not of myself, it is a gift. E oh, I know. Now you want to write it. Okay. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's a good one to have. I'm telling you. Now, along with those three, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, write down John 14, 16. Because when he takes up residence in your life, he is there forever. He's there forever. Listen to Romans 8.11. Romans 8.11. If, first class condition means if this is true in the, if it's true in the if, it's true in the then. In the Greek, that's a first class condition. Really important. You can't see it in the English. You got to put it down. That's a first class condition. If the spirit of him, talked about the Holy Spirit, if the spirit of him who raised, if the spirit of him who raised him from the dead dwells in you, here's first class condition, and he does, and you know he does because I gave you scripture. The Bible says so. I gave you John 14, 16. Now I gave you Romans 8, 11. Now I get to the then. It don't say then, but it means then. Are you with me? See, there's a comma. If the spirit of him who raised, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also, will also not just indwell you, dwell in you is, is indwell, not only will he indwell you, watch this, here's the second thing that you get at salvation, spiritual life. <laughs> Ain't that wonderful? Will also, see, will dwell in you, will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit. More, to your mortal body means the one that's alive. The body that will one day die or be raptured. That's where the Holy Spirit dwells. Today in the church age, inside every believer's body. And in that mortal body comes spiritual life. The life of God has been activated by being born again, by being regenerated. And that life is, the, is what the Holy Spirit deals with. That life is spiritual life. Our life is now spiritual life. And that spiritual life is driven by the Holy Spirit. Listen to me. Holy Spirit. Spiritual life. <laughs> I hope you're having as much fun as I am. I love this. Are you getting any of it? This is what transformation is about. Don't be conformed to the world, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get into the word of God and see what God, God has developed everything necessary for you to live a transformed life. I live it every day, and I'm so thankful for it every day. I'm so thankful for to being delivered by the grace of God from, tr from conformity to the world where there's muck and mire and misery. To be saved by the grace of God through the work of Christ on the cross, his burial and resurrection from the dead. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside my mortal body and has brought life to my mortal body. 
my, my, my. <laughs> you ought to be getting excited. I ought to be, I, you ought to be saying amen to somebody if it's no more than to me. Now, you see in Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 11, you have two of the eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit and spiritual life. Oh, you can read about them in that pamphlet, those 50 things that are free by the grace of God. Let me ask you a question at this point and see if you've been listening. How long will the indwelling Holy Spirit be with you? How long will he be with you? Did you say forever? <laughs> you should be so happy. Think how many people have lied to you. And here's the truth. What's the Bible say? Two of the great teachers of the new covenant, Jesus and Paul, both said it in agreement. As a result of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, every church-age believer's body becomes the temple of God, the naos, the place where God dwells. God, the Holy Spirit. The entire operation of God's program runs through the mobile church. God sunk his entire plan of God in the church age into a mobile church called a believer indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. Your body is no longer your own, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It's been brought through Christ on the cross and is now indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God to do all of the plan of God and ma manipulate everything in the plan of God out through your life. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 20. Paul pounded it in the book of Corinthians, didn't he? Are you getting it? You say, Ron, I've never heard any of this. You have today. I can't speak for yesterday and where your life has been. But you need to pay attention. You need to stay with me a year. If you're listening to me on Wednesday, stay with me. You'd be smart to stay with me on Sunday as well I, in the life of Elijah, but you stay with me. I'll open your eyes to the word of God like you've never known. And I'm not boasting about it. I'm telling you the truth. I am driven for this information to give to you. Now, here's the third thing. It is very important that every church age believer understands, now watch this, the connection between the indwelling spirit, Holy Spirit of God, the indwelling spirit of God, Holy Spirit, and the human spirit. No. <laughs> I'll read it again. It's so important, it deserves a second chance. It's very important for every church age believer to understand the connection between the indwelling spirit, Holy Spirit, and the human spirit. That born again human spirit. Born again. Who has a desire to live the transformational life. No more conformed to the world. Now transformed to the plan of God. Are you listening to me? Great doctrinal point. Now I'm going to show it to you. Every member of the human race is born trichotomous. He has three, he has three, a, a form of three parts. He's got a body. He's got a soul. He's got a human spirit. He's trichotomous. Every human being is trichotomous. You can't study the Bible and not know that. You find that in the first three chapters of Genesis. God formed the body. He breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know what he, you know, you know what he had? 
He had a human soul. In the body was breathed the human soul and human spirit. We're all. Nishimahayim. Nishimahayim. God breathed into us our nostrils, two nostrils. Breathed into us lives in the plural. Well, I, I don't know. You, you guys study the Bible. <laughs> I don't know how many books you got in your home. Read the Bible. It's the only book you're going to have in the library of heaven. The only thing you can take from earth is the Bible. I'm not talking about the one you bought. I'm talking about the one that was bought for you. Now watch this, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace, that's Romans 5.1. Now may the God of peace himself, himself, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Now what does he mean entirely? He sells you. Your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved completely. How long? Without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second member of the, herd in he of the Lord in heaven that's going to come a second time for the church, you and I, the believer in Christ, the gospel. Oh, you're missing this, and that's okay. Look, I got a a wonderful young minister in the church. He says you got to hear it 10 times to get it. I would disagree with that. You think you got it, and then all of a sudden you don't. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you aside entirely, body, soul, and spirit, complete, until Christ returns. That's the existence of the church. You all. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now, make sure you got your Bible open for this one. Romans 5, 15, 16, and 17. Now, I'm going to go to that because this is gigantic. Eighth chapter... Here we are, verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about 1 Corinthians 15, 22. You're either born in Adam or you're born to get in Christ. Every human being is born in Adam is spiritually dead. Every person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ is born again in Christ and is alive, spiritually alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. I you know you write it down. Read it later. Write it down. Because in Adam, you're in the slave market of Adam's sin. You're in the slave market. You're in bondage in the slave market of Adam's sin. It's not what you did. It's what, other, what's, what somebody else did to you, like Joseph. Joseph didn't sell himself into slavery. His brother sold him. Adam sold you into slavery. For Romans 5. I'm at 8. Romans 5. You ought to read 5. Okay. I'm just telling you. I, know. I, I get loud, but I get excited. You have not received a spirit. Now, who, who is you? The you is Christian. You listen. You've been you've been you've been rescued. Colossians 1.13. You've been rescued from Adam and play, and 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 transferred into Christ. So you don't you you do not receive a spirit of slavery bondage leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption. That's a little less. 
you have received a spiritual of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. What did I get the moment I believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I got, by the Holy Spirit, I got adopted. One, another one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit. I got adopted. I got adopted. Hebrews 12, 8, what was I before? In Adam, I was a bastard. I was an illegitimate child. King James, look, I'm not being ugly with you. Bastards, King James, for illegitimate uh, cleanup uh, and the New American Standard. Now, you know what both of those mean, don't you? That's, that's what you were. Now, you're, now you've been adopted through Jesus Christ. You've been adopted. You weren't born this way. You've been born again this way. You are now adopted as a child of God. You will always be a child of God. You will always be a child of God because you got born again. And when you did, you got adopted into the royal family of God in Christ. And, and listen, listen, you know, this is what people miss. Go back to verse 15. And when I got, when the Holy Spirit adopted me into the family of God at the point of salvation, I got adopted. Whether you knew it or not, now you know it. You, the Bible says you got adopted. At the moment I believed I got adopted, the moment I got adopted, the Holy Spirit took up residence in me, and the Holy Spirit witnessed to my spirit that I was a child of God, and I cried, Abba, Father. My human spirit cried, Abba, Father. It's like a baby born. They pat him, and he goes, eh. When we're born again, we don't just cry and take a deep breath for air. The Holy Spirit of God witnesses to our spirit, and our spirit says, Abba, Father, our first words back to God come through the Holy Spirit's ministry to the human spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks through our human spirit through salvation, positive volition to Christ, and salvation speaks back to God the Father, Abba, Father. Are you with me today? And at some point, I realize that. Now my heart speaks it. My heart, my heart speaks to God, Abba, Father. I can't tell you how many times a day my heart cries out to God, my Father, my Daddy, my Abba, Father, who will never leave me nor forsake me, who loves me enough that he sent his Son, his only begotten Son, a die of cruel death to release me from the bondage of Adam's sin, to redeem me into the Christ. When I learned in the Bible that I had been adopted as a child of God, I can tell you, you don't know my personal history, but I can tell you that was a great day in my life. I was 22 years old, and that was a great day in my life. Maybe 23. It was a great day in my life. The first words spoken from my new birth. To, 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 listen, the first words spoken from my new birth, from being born again, was prompted by the Holy Spirit connecting with my spirit and speaking the words back to the Father. Abba, Father. It shows residence. It shows the Holy Spirit has taken possession. And now it's sealed. The whole thing is sealed when that happens. Sealed until the day of redemption. Name written in the book of life. Sealed deal. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came our way today? Stop listening to people lie to you. Listen to the word of God. Speak truth. Let the spirit of truth speak truth to your soul. 
my, 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 what a wonderful thing that is. Cries out, out. Now watch verse 16. Verse 16. The Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. See, I just explained that. I just explained it. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because you live in the church age, he takes up residence. As soon as he takes up residence, he clicks into the human spirit and speaks to the Father. We've got one, Abba Father. First work spoken through the Holy Spirit of the human spirit of man. And you probably didn't even realize it. And later you read, open the Bible, and it says such important things like this in your life. You should read Galatians 4, 4 through 7, where Paul teaches it again. The Spirit himself, the Spirit himself, the Spirit alone, the Spirit himself, the Spirit by himself, I don't know why I'm hollering. I'm just getting excited. Bears witness, bears witness with our spirit, human spirit, that we are children of God. And when he did it, our human spirit, not, not the intelligent part of us, because we haven't learned it from the Bible that we were adopted. Christ of the Father. As we take a, a breath of spiritual life. The Spirit says, I have a Father, and the Father says, sealed until the day of redemption. Oh, jeez. If you're not getting excited by now, something's wrong with you. I mean, how great is this? The Spirit bears witness. What you don't really see is the word in the Greek. It is the word sum, which comes from the preposition together, soon, together, materero, the witness, the witness or martyred witness, the witness, the witness. <laughs> See, it's together. The Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit himself witness to, witnesses together to the human spirit that we're children of God. And when we do it in, in our birth experience, he speaks Abba, Father. The language of deity. You know, everybody wants a tongue. There you got one. Tongue, the tongue of deity, Abba, Father. You want one, there it is. There's the one you ought to be thankful for. Verse 17. If, that's a first-class condition, if that's true, then something else is true. If children, heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. If children, then heirs. Watch this now. Also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If you are children of God, then you're an heir, an heir of God, and a fellow heir with Christ. Think about a fellow heir with Christ. God's only begotten son, I'm a fellow heir with him. In that 50 things you receive in salvation, read the su section that says 20 status privileges that you can never lose in time and eternity. This is so good, I tell you people. Wish I had more time than I got today. Now, watch. There's a phrase. Now, see, that's complete. Now there's another phrase. See, there's a period. There's another phrase. If indeed. If indeed. See, that's the first class condition translated since. Since you have the first if. If, 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 if a child of God, then an heir, an heir of God, and a fellow heir with Christ. Since you have that, since you have that, watch this now in verse 17. Since we have that, then we have this. 
then we suffer. We suffer. And this word for suffer is suffering with Christ, this Paschal, with the S-U-N on the front of it, together. We suffer together with Christ. We suffer with Christ. Philippians 1.29. It has been granted, it has been granted by God to us not only to believe, but to suffer with Christ. And he says, in order that we may also be glorified with him, and he uses the word soon together on the front of the word glorified, and it means together with him. Three times it's together with him. I know. I know. The power of the Greek language is magnificent. Now let me close with point four. There are two sources of influence upon the human spirit that you need to be aware of. As a believer, there is the spirit of the world and there is the spirit of God. They both influence the human spirit. This is taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, and 3. It's also, Paul also talks about it again in, in 2 Corinthians. The spirit of the world operates by the God of this world, Satan. 1 John 5, 19. Satan is referred to as the evil one of influence in the world. In John 12, 31, not on your paper, but in John 12, 31, 14.30 and 16.11, he's called the, Satan's called the ruler of the world. He is in opposition to the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, in the life of a believer. It is because of that influence upon the human spirit that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, the fourth chapter, three and four. Listen to this. Four, three and four. If our gospel is veiled, verse three, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, the unsaved, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving ones that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ was the image of God. He says, we do not preach ourselves, but, but Christ Jesus, our Lord, and ourselves as bond servants for Christ's sake. And he goes on to talk about it. He's, there Satan is called the God of the world or the ages. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1.21. It, confl- it shows opposition between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God... The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. Not going to find God in the wisdom of the world. It's the, the system of the world is run by the devil. Now he may use the name God and put a capital on it and then teach you how to work it as a, as a, a, little, L, a little G. Because you see, he's the God of the world. He tried to get Jesus to do that in Matthew 4. Come on. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message of uh, the, the message preached, that is the gospel of grace salvation, to save those who believe. <laughs> Listen to this. For to us, for to us believers, God revealed them, that is the truth of God's teaching, for, for, for to us, God revealed them through the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. 
For who among men know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man? We would refer to that as reflection. Reflection. Which is in him, the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the thoughts of God no man knows except the spirit of God. Listen, the person who has the indwelling Holy Spirit can, can know the thoughts of God. There are two things the spirit of man know, can, can know. He can know his own thoughts, according to Paul, and he can know the thoughts of God through the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. The thoughts of God. No, no man can know the thoughts of another man. He can only know the thoughts of himself. But the born-again person knows the thoughts of God. Ma, ma, ma. Yet the thoughts of God no man knows except by the Holy Spirit of God. For we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but those taught by the Holy Spirit, who combines spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. <laughs> oh, man, I've given you enough. Your brain hurts, doesn't it? Huh? You can pull down. If you didn't get our study guide, you can go to our web and you can pull this down. It's all printed out for you. You would be wise to study it more than once. Even if you think you know it, you don't know it. Even when you think you know it, you don't know the whole story. Like Paul Harvey, there's always a page two. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today, those who have come with, to us by this Wednesday study, as we introduce the grieving ministry. Do not grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Mama, who thought we could do that? I pray today, Father, this lesson would touch the lives and open their spiritual awakening to the truth of God's word in regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because the devil lies, he lies, he lies, he lies, he lies about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. May people begin to study the Bible as they've never studied it before, under the ministry of the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, by confession of sin, by staying focused on the indwelling teaching ministry, beginning to listen to the Spirit of God rather than the spirit of man. In Jesus' name, amen.